We're continuing our series through the Sermon on the Mount, and wherever you are today, I'm so glad you're joining with us. We've had people from Italy, from Colorado, from New York, and all in between, and so I'm glad that you're joining with us. So wherever you are as well, I hope that you'll engage, whether here in person or off wherever home is for you. See, we're going through the Lord's, uh, this incredible sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, Chris did the Lord's Prayer, and today we're going to continue in the passage right after that. And Jesus basically says there are two kingdoms that are at collision course in your life that you have to choose between. And here's the thing. While that is absolutely true and accurate, very few of us see the war in our own lives because churches and society, well, it's all filled with people who want to sit on the fence kind of. Or we say, oh yeah, God's really important and we do lip service to God. But when you look at our priorities We look at our lifestyle and what we do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all of a sudden, oh, wow, ooh, as I look at what Jesus challenged between two kingdoms, maybe I'm more based in another kingdom than I thought. Here's the thing, when it comes to where uh, our life really is based, the first example he gives is that of treasure. I think we lie to ourselves on what we treasure or what we value more than we realize. Uh, He comes out just right off with some, mm, verse 19 of chapter 6 in Matthew. That's going to be our text in Matthew chapter 6. We'll be in through the whole way. Don't store up treasures here on earth. Where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Now, just real quick clarity in that that kind of time frame, you couldn't store stuff, you couldn't salvage things, you couldn't keep things. Nothing was secure long term. So they really got what he was saying here. And we got all kinds of storage units and all kinds of control, and we get things airtight, and we got banks, we got vaults, and Yet he's still saying, be careful where you put your treasure. Let's continue. Verse 20, store your treasures where? He says, in heaven, where moths and rust can't destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, here's the key, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Guys, gals, the sum total of your life is really going to be on the balance scales on where your treasure is, where your values are in this world. And it'll be based in one of two places. Jesus makes real clear that many will choose on earth, that it'll be based on earth. And that is the ambitions of the world, the stuff that we can have, this life around us. And we have a strong fascination with all that stuff. And the spell of materialism goes deeper within us than what we care to admit. See, now, some of you might hear this and you just kind of jump to the extreme and you go, wow, so that means we just can't have anything, right? No, no, that's not what it says. He's being very clear. It's the selfish accumulation of possessions that is forbidden. The Bible doesn't say that you can't have property. It doesn't say that you can't take care of others or that you can't have some money in your life. In fact, you're told to prepare for tomorrow, but don't put your hope in what you have. That's the difference. See, we're in the land of much. So we have closets full of stuff. We got garages full of stuff. We have attics full of stuff. And then we build a shed to put more stuff in. And then we get a garage, and it's not big enough, so we add another layer of garage on to put more stuff. And then that's still not enough. And so we go get storage units, and we put stuff in there. And then we look at everybody else's stuff and go, I need more stuff. Do you see the problem that we fight with? It's never going to be enough when it's based here on earth because the stuff that we have here is not bad. But if you put your base in that, you put your hope in that, you put your identity in that, 
it'll always leave you empty. So he says, base this in heaven. You know, your treasure is to be based in heaven. Your deepest values are to be based in heaven. He says, live for more. And he doesn't just list out. He, he kind of just gives us a picture. You see what the Bible says. He's saying, you know what? When you love God, when you love people, when you get to know God, and when you share your faith, when you develop character, these are all temporal activities with an eternal consequence. And therefore, you're sending treasure to heaven. It's stuff that lasts beyond today. I hear Jesus as I read this just pleading with us, guys, don't waste your life. He takes it a little deeper, and it's our heart that he looks at next. And he gives a contrast of light and darkness between being blind versus being able to see. He says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Now I want to clarify something in here that I think we misunderstand because of the context of how we read I today. When I say I as in the physical I that he talks about, the physical I is used in scripture to represent the heart, the very essence of who you are, what you are, what you hold on to in here. And it's not just your physical what you see. In modern society, here's kind of what we do. We tend to say, oh, the eye, it's, it's what I see that comes in that affects my heart. But biblically and contextually, the, their society, what they would have heard as they read this was what my heart is filled with, it determines what I see. It's a total flip, and so we try and control all the circumstances, and I just, I can't look at anything bad, and any, we can turn the most pure and beautiful of things of this world into evil when our heart is bad by what we see. And God is like going, wait a second, you can't clean up everything around you, but you can clean your heart, and so what you fill yourself with is how now it'll change how you see. So let me read this in the way it's actually intending. I'm going to replace I with heart. Your heart is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your heart is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. When your heart is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness in your heart, how deep that darkness is. So the end goal biblically is always to say, what is your heart filled with? What is your heart desire? And to make sure that there's only one thing that is going to fill that up and it be right, and that is with Jesus Christ. See, if we're filled with darkness, and that's so hard for us to be honest about, but you, you see, you can't hang out with Jesus very long and you not realize that there are two things on a collision course. My way, his way. Bam. Bam. <sighs> Well, I, I, I love you, God. Bam, my way, his way. Oh, they're not the same because my way is selfish. It always is. His way is so different than mine. You know, Keith Green put it this way, Lord, it's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. <laughs> the me, 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 me that we live in as a generation, all of us, no matter your age, we're more focused on me than we ever care to admit. It corrupts us to the core. He says we're to fill ourselves with light, and it changes how we see things around us. See, there's one true source of light. There's only one source that actually makes a difference, that changes who we are, and that is in Jesus Christ. Now, please hear me. When he says he is the light of the world, he cannot be a side thing. He's either the main thing or he's nothing in your life. That's the only way. Jesus can't be just kind of, oh, he's my buddy on Sunday. He's my occasionally when I need him. I send up an SOS when things are bad. It doesn't work that way. He's either boss, he's the main thing, or he's not at all. Now, unfortunately, we often don't know where we've placed him because we're so good at lying to ourselves. I've done it, you've done it, until the end of life. You know, life has this way, the theory kind of goes that I agree with, old age reveals at essence who we were all along. 
So when your wrinkles start and the hair turns gray or falls out, the joints don't work anymore, the arteries are clogged, and you don't have much left, at essence now, that's all you have? That's who you were by your decisions, what you invested in, what you made in a thousand little decisions day after day after day is finally shown. Let me give you an example. And I, I mean this in a very loving manner towards my grandparents, uh, but I, I had a grandma and a grandpa, both who've passed away now, one whom was very easy to love, one who was kind of hard to love. I loved them, loved them both. My grandpa, he was a farmer, rancher, hardcore, hardworking man. He got the job done. Get out of my way. I'm going to get it done. I'm a man's man. I'm tough and I'm independent. I don't need anybody to take care of me. Don't pamper me. Just that kind of guy. And at the end of life, in a thousand little ways, he had cultivated a very selfish end result. And very few people wanted to be around him. He was a hard man to love. My grandma, on the other hand, oh my goodness, in a thousand little ways, and decision after decision, day after day, she just had a heart that was exploding with Jesus and love and life. You couldn't help but love that woman. I mean, she was like five foot ten, like 90 pounds, a tiny little thing, and she was one godly vivacious woman. She would read the, I remember going to visit them and a lot of times you kind of like duck when grandpa's around and then grandma will come out. You're like, oh, but you'd see her in the morning. First thing she'd be out there reading her Bible every day. I remember when she got to the point that she couldn't see hardly and she had like a, a magnifying glass that would probably show Pluto or something. Uh, and she could read that Bible and she'd just read through every day. And then when she got senile, she'd read her Bible several times a day because she'd forget that she'd already read it. But it was just a part of who she was. But she was just this wonderful woman that just loved because that's what she had filled her life with. What are you filling yourself up with today? Every little decision, where your treasures are, where your values are, huh? those thousand little decisions today and tomorrow and the next are going to show at essence who you really are and what you've been filled with. You know, he takes it a little further in this next one and he basically says, where do you get your worth from? And where does that come from? In society, you're going to get thousands of different ways that are told you and promised you. You know, if you just do this, if you just buy this, if you just accomplish this, you're going to, oh, I'm going to have value and worth. And you know, all of them deliver a little bit. Hey, you can buy a new car and you're like driving off the lot. You're like, yeah, this is great. And then you get the first payment. Oh, this isn't so great. And you, know, you buy your house and then something goes wrong. And you're like, oh, you get the new iPhone and then a new one comes out. You know, you buy this, you buy that. And it always feels great for a second. And that is the lie of Satan. Nothing wrong with buying stuff. But if your hope there, your value is there, it always under delivers and over promises. Your worth is going to come from who you are devoted to or what you are devoted to in life. Who do you serve? Who are you mastered by? Matthew chapter 6, one more verse now, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. You will hate one, love the other. You will be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, let me just say once again what he is not saying. So many people have said, yep, money is the root of all evil. That is a misquote. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, when you're loving money, when you're mastered by money, now we have a problem. See, there's nothing wrong with having money. It's a tool that you can do a lot of good with. And it's a tool that can totally conquer you and become your master. Now, in this world... You could have more than one house, you could have more than one car, you could have more than one computer, you can have more than one investment, you can have more than one all kinds of stuff. In some places in the world, you can have more than one spouse. I wouldn't recommend it. But um, 
when it comes down to it, you can only have one master. That's a solo spot. One master. That's it. Who or what do you serve? You declare that by what you're devoted to, who you're devoted to. It's not like just saying, I'm devoted to my, my college team. I'm devoted to my sports. I mean, you might have numerous things that you're devoted to in that sense, but you can only have one master. See, many appear to serve God on Sunday mornings, and then the rest of the week they do something else. Are you devoted to wealth? Because being devoted to wealth is a dangerous thing to be. It's not a bad thing to have wealth, but to be devoted to wealth is a very dangerous thing. See, we, we honor God with our lips, and then our actions and the fruit of our life, the values in which we make our decisions, it's clear that it often it's based on titles, on prestige, on money, on wealth, and what we have in the bank more than what we have in our heart in a relationship with God. Now, here's what God tells us. Here's what Jesus makes this clear. Your devotion can be to one, that is to God alone. See, God can only, please hear this, God can only be served with an exclusive devotion. You go, well, why? Because he's God. And he says, stop loving the creation more than me as the creator. Do we need to care for the creation? Absolutely. Do we need to enjoy the creation? Absolutely. Do we need to take care of those around us? Absolutely. All this stuff is important, but you can only be devoted to one, and that is to him, he the creator. Now, John Tillotson's put it this way. He says, who, he who provides for this life but takes no care for eternity is wise for a moment and a fool forever. Jesus' words, he states, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? I want to ask you to evaluate yourself. If you're thinking about getting a second job, getting ready to buy a new house or get a different car, whatever it might be, I want to ask why are you getting ready to get that car? Why are you getting ready to get that house? Is it a tool that you're just going to use, or is it something that you're getting value from, worth from? Because if you're trying to get your worth from it, the world will overpromise and underdeliver every time. Only one can be in that place. That's God. So be careful where you invest your time, your talents, your treasure. One more question. It has to do with ambition. See, there are two driving forces that will drive what we get done. I hope that you're driven. I hope that you have a heart. I hope that you're passionate in life. I just hope that you're passionate for the right reasons, which is what God really challenges us. Now, this next section, before I read it, you know, is going to be verses 25 all the way down to 34. It is seldom preached together with what we just did. It's on a subject that we care a lot about, on the anxiety and fear of life and, and having God provide for us. And, and we go, yeah, we need to talk about worry and anxiety. And we separate it from what we just preached. But you can't do that, not honestly. Jesus is preaching a sermon here, and he says, therefore, in some translations, other translation, he says, that is why. What is he doing there? He's building a bridge between this truth and this truth. So they're connected. Please don't miss that. So he's saying, therefore, if you put your treasure in eternity, therefore, if God really is number one, therefore, if your heart is really pure, now let me give you some truths that it'll change. So now with that context, verse 25, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink, enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. Your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon, all of his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. 
And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, will he certainly care for you? Yes. Why do you have so little faith? Don't worry about these things, saying, oh, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Those things dominate the thoughts of the unbelieving world. Your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek, big, big change here, verse 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Jesus whittles it all down to a choice between self and Christ, which is really every section. It comes down to it's self versus Christ, self versus Christ, self versus Christ. So are you living in the constant presence of self? That's a dangerous place to live. The presence of self will result in a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear because you're like, oh, what do people think of me? Oh, what do I wear? Oh, does this look good on me? Oh, what about eating? Oh, what about this? And what about tomorrow? What about, what about, what about? Society is going to force you into a mold of me, 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 saying, you know, hey, you know what? You need to look out for what's good for you. You know, you need to take care of number one. Hey, you deserve this. Emptiness will always be the result when you're the number one goal. Of course, you need to take care of yourself. You need to be cautious about being smart. You need to invest in things. But that can't be your primary. It can't be number one. You can't live in the awareness of self all the time. When you're preoccupied with your own security, what happens? He uses all the examples in that passage. If you just look at it. You become preoccupied with your finances, your food, your body, your fashion, your future. That's verses 25 through 32. And then he does this big shift in mindset in verses 33 and 34. Jesus' alternative here is just beautiful where he says, seek God's rule, seek God's kingdom, seek God's righteousness, And the worries and the fears of this world begin to pass away as you live in the presence of Christ. See, Christ is surrounding us. It's Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ around me. That is what changes this world. Now, once again, let me make sure you could misread this passage, go to extreme, misunderstand, not put it in context. Like he says, you know, the birds and the flowers, they don't work. Does that mean you shouldn't work? Well, the Bible also says you don't work, you don't eat. That's pretty blunt. And so you ought to do that. He's saying don't put your hope in that. Don't put your value in that. He's like, well, you know, put God as number one. So that means you don't care for other people. No, the Bible says you're like really worthless if you don't care for your family, if you don't take care of them. The Bible says you ought to look out for orphans and widows. You ought to take care of those who are the less of the needy, those who are struggling. That's clear throughout the Bible. It's a matter of putting God first. And if you love God, You can't help but love people around you. So it's a matter of putting God in the right place and then things fall into place. See, if if we put the wrong thing at number one, we become obsessed with these things and we don't turn life over to him and we don't let him be in control of our day to day. I want to give you an idea of how to put Jesus in the center of things. Just a simple little exercise. This is one that has helped me at times, and it's something I've visualized. And and it's just a matter of, you might imagine this, saying, what is it that you're holding on to in life that you just don't want to let go of? I mean, I, I call it, what are you holding on to with white knuckle intensity? You know the stuff that you really hold on to. It is... Is it your appearance? Is it your uh, reputation? Is it your home? Is it getting that finally nice home or nicer home? Is it that job? Is it your reputation? I mean, what is that that you're holding on? Is it, is it your children or your marriage? I mean, things that you're, you, I mean, they're good things. They're not bad things. What is it that you hold on to? And I want to ask you to think about, can you really do that much with it? 
Here's the exercise. Imagine whatever that is you're holding on to, and this is what I do as a part of my prayer, is I just open my hands. You know what? what that just relaxed my whole body. When I'm doing this, I'm like, oh, oh. and a lot of you are living with someone that's like this, and you're like, oh, let go of me, please. You got to relax, let go a little bit. Imagine just your hands opening up. Now, you remember that song that maybe you've heard or maybe you sang as a kid, he's got the whole world in his hands. You know, it's just a children's song. Imagine Jesus' big hands underneath yours, cupped there. And just as you pray, there's something beautiful about just turning those hands over and letting the problems fall out of your hands into his. We're going to come back to that in just a second. In fact, I want to just challenge you to, after the sermon, to stick around. Don't rush out because we've got in a little extended worship where I want to let you process for a little bit, please. But I want to tell you a story as we kind of bring this down for a second. And then I want to come back to that exercise. You might have heard of St. Patrick. Obviously, there's a big holiday over it and things that go on. And, but what most people don't realize is St. Patrick, he was actually British. And he wasn't from Ireland. He was kidnapped from Britain as a little boy, sold into slavery to work as a slave in Ireland. And he had just this incredible knack of being able to relax and just trust in God's presence. Well, at one point, he, as he drew close to God, he also got delivered from slavery. He escaped his oppressors. And, and then he came back later as a missionary to the very people who had enslaved him to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was known for a prayer that I'm going to share in just a moment, a portion of, and there's a portion in here where it's just a declaration. That's what I'm going to read. And where he's just saying the declaration of a truth. He's declaring that God is all around me. He's well known for this prayer. And as I read, I want to ask, uh, would you join with me and just stand? If you're at home, I want to ask you to stand. People in the balcony here stand. And I want you to think about, put your hands out in front like we said earlier. I want you to imagine what you've been holding on to, whether it's good, neutral, bad, doesn't really matter. What is it that you're just worried about and trying to control? And I want to ask you to imagine, as I pray, opening your hands and then turning them over as I read this prayer, I want to ask, just keep your eyes closed at this point and let me share this prayer of St. Patrick. Christ with me. Christ before me. Oh, Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right and Christ on my left. Christ when I lay down. Christ when I sit down. Christ when I arise. Christ in the heart of every person who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. <laughs> 